Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, how many people out there are cat people? That's a, good, that's a good number. That's kind of our pitch at things like PAX. We just kind of see people and go, cats, <laughs> brings them over. Oh, my name's Niccolo, and this is the title of my talk. First, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Buwan, Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, this session is a deep dive into how we designed our uh, sliding puzzle game, Necograms. It's based on a popular logic puzzle called Nonograms. Uh, are people familiar with Nonograms? Yeah. Great. People are familiar with nonograms, like, yes, yes. <laughs> I love nonograms. <laughs> uh, we talk about the, the difficulties we had with level generation and some of the processes that we undertook to kind of use uh, level generation, but then test, rate them, and curate them. I'm going to go through slides quickly, but I have a lot of them. So <laughs> this is uh, necograms, just for people who haven't seen it yet. Now, uh, before we get to that point, <laughs> I'm going to build up from nonograms as the start. So obviously, as any great researcher, I went straight to Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, in 1987, Nonishida, a Japanese graphics editor, won a competition in Tokyo uh, by designing grid pictures using skyscraper lights that were turned on or off. Uh, if you've seen those things, like you can play Tetris on the side of a building. Um, this led to the idea of a puzzle based around filling in certain squares on a grid. And it was coincidentally and independently um, also discovered and published elsewhere. Uh, the name Nonograms, I believe, comes from the uh, original attributed author. My first experience with Nonograms was on my Game Boy Color. Not this Game Boy Color, which has a nice backlit screen, but on the original back uh, Game Boy Color, which you kind of had to tilt and angle to get the sun right, or had this little light that came off the top just so I could see it. And this game was called uh, Mario's Picross. There's also a version on the Super uh, NES, the Super Famicom. And I, I loved it. Uh, since the 90s, up until as recently as you know, this year or last year, there have been various no, uh, nonogram games that have come out. A lot of people would be familiar with the Picross series. Uh, it's also been published in various books and magazines as, I think, Gridlers or uh, Japanese crosswords. Uh, the Picross series on the DS and 3DS were very popular. They had a 3D variant as well. Uh, definitely check out Murder by Numbers. It's kind of a visual novel slash Phoenix Wright slash nonograms game. So just to build up a very basic nonogram, <clears throat> You start with a grid, you fill in a solution. It looks like something. And then you encode that solution. So here the encoding um, for each row and each column, it kind of says, if you can see the cursor, yeah, there's one filled space and then there's some amount of um, other spaces, gaps, and then there's another filled space. So that first row is one, one. The second row has three filled spaces, so it's just three, then one, three, four, four, and the same for the columns. So now you've encoded that solution you put in originally, and you remove that solution. And this is your nonogram. 
and the player interaction, that play, is decoding it from this hint. Now, fortunately for this one, uh, there's one solution. It's possible that for larger ones, or very sparse, or very dense solutions, you can have, uh, it's not a sort of a one-to-one encoding, decoding. They're also kind of nonogram purists. They're like, it has to be multiples of five. It's gonna be a five by five, a 10 by 10, or a 15 by 15, etc. So let's quickly solve that. You can identify which rows um, are known. So for example, that column uh, says five, and there's only five spaces, so we have to fill that in. Uh, there's a row there which has one and then some amount of spaces, then three, so we know that that has to be filled in. You can iterate. There's a lot of strategies to solve nonograms. These ones are fairly trivial. Uh, this is the simple boxes strategy. So you identify these conjunctions of possible cells that could be filled. In those last two rows, they've got four uh, continuous um, blocks that have to be filled in. So you know that that's either going to be four shoved over to the left or shoved over to the right. And it means that these middle three are always going to be occupied. And you could iterate using that same sort of logic. And you get your solution back. So that's a very basic nonogram, uh, hopefully enough to get people hooked. Definitely play as many nonograms as you can. Now onto the next step. We're not quite at necograms yet. Uh, maybe striking my ego slightly, I've called this uh, nicograms. So quite a while ago, I wanted to make a nonograms game for mobile, uh, but it was hard to fit everything onto that small screen. The numbers take up a lot of screen real estate, so your actual picture is quite small. And the bigger that it gets, or the more complex it gets, the more space those could take. And I didn't want to have to scroll through the puzzle, or some nonograms games, they break it up into different pieces and put it on, on the board. This is when I thought, nonograms are where it's at. I really want to create the biggest possible ones I can, and those numbers are taking up too much space. So I started thinking about how to represent nonograms without those numbers. So I take the same target solution, and I consider the rows and the columns separately, and I put these blocks in, and it's the same information. You've got one block, and then another block in the row, and then you've got three, and then you've got one and three. And when you superimpose them, you get the same solution back. So this is very much the same thing, but instead of that numerical logic, we're now uh, converting it into a sliding puzzle and in, to uh, kind of make it so that it's not trivial to look at it and solve it, we can shuffle those using those same rules. Those blocks can't be next to each other. And that obfuscates the solution. So now you've got a puzzle that we can solve again using similar logic and thinking to those traditional nonograms, but without those numbers. So this is how I kind of think about it. And other people have different ways of solving them. But I could look at it and I can kind of go, well, these cells have to be occupied for those same reasons. That middle column is entirely occupied, so we know that there has to be something there on the horizontal axes. <clears throat> because I know that those ones at the bottom need something there, I'm going to have to pull something down. And because I know that there's no other blocks in that column, suddenly there's spaces where things can't be, so I have to move those away. And I repeat that, and I repeat that, and once more, we're done, I've got my cat back. So I thought, oh great, this is neat. I was very enthusiastic about it, I've got a prototype. <laughs> I'll work on that for a few weeks. Um, it should be out by the end of the year. I mean, it's, it was only, I think, mid-year at that point, seems very reasonable, basic game. <laughs> Hmm. Sort of life happens, I suppose. <laughs> this is us now. We actually had quite a nice office, but I tried to make it look as dreary as possible. I cut out all the windows, so you just have to imagine that they're there. Uh, this is our art director for it, um, Lauren Fletcher, our programmer, James Strauss, who's down at the front, and a fellow director at the company, Min Tran. And yeah, for those 15 years, or a good bulk of it, we were working on our own various projects. We started a non-profit called Let's Make Games over in Perth. It's like an IGDA chapter. 
Um, I was running this company, Hungry Sky, with Min, and we made uh, so many exhibits, so many interactive exhibits. Um, but our heart um, was drawn to games, which are a common thing. So we're doing well. Uh, we sponsored the Perth Games Festival in 2015, and we had a booth, and we could showcase whatever we wanted there. And it's quite difficult to grab an exhibit piece from a museum and put it into your little booth. So we thought, let's have a game jam. I don't know if other people had this. We watched a lot of Amnesia Fortnite, which is sort of a documentary series about game jams at Double Fine Productions. We're super enthused. And obviously, that went very well. Yeah, so we spent, we had around two weeks allocated. We spent most of that time uh, failing to decide on a game to make. <laughs> So not an exact transcript, but I remember this uh, interaction with our art director. I just said, okay, we failed to come up with a game uh, to make this game jam, but here's something I was working on sort of 15 odd years ago. Uh, I sketched it out on, a, on, the, on the whiteboard, showed it to Lauren, and she just kind of said, how do we make this cute? <laughs> we both arrived at Cats. And we thought, well, how do we show that they're at rest? We said, oh, they go to sleep when they're on a cushion. And that's how we had that basic mechanic. So after uh, prototyping that quickly and playing around with it, it felt quite natural to have these things move around. We added some blocking elements to prevent items going next to each other. Uh, part of that was because initially we thought maybe the cats will hiss if you try to put them next to each other, but we didn't have time to animate it, so... <laughs> Instead, there's a little cat toy that stops them going next to each other. And here's that cat game that we, uh, that we had earlier, that puzzle solution, now encoded as cats uh, and cushions on the beach. Lauren approved. So there we go, we created our prototype. Uh, for some reason, we made an inflatable cat to celebrate. Um, uh, ben, um, I'm gonna play a bit of the audio that Ben had put together. This is our audio director. Uh, as I mentioned, we came from this exhibit background and a key part of sound design for exhibits is making something which isn't going to irritate the people who work there. <laughs> um, because they're gonna li listen to it on loop, so. Uh, it, it came in very handy for creating a sort of meditative um, puzzle game. So I think the brief for this was cute, cats, won't irritate you, kind of like a game show. So you can imagine more of that. <laughs> We also uh, thought at this point we'd have to communicate these mechanics, however simple, um, ad nauseum. So we had a, a mascot character, Professor Enyan, a polysomnographic technologist studying the sleeping pattern of cats. And I think at that expo there was, it was basically just a guided tour by this cat telling you how to get cats to sleep. And, uh, most people skipped through it as fast as they could and they kind of got the game, so... Uh, Professor Anyan is now a minor character in the Necrograms world. This is our booth. Um, we're so happy to be there. We got a lot more enjoyment out of this, I think. Not that we didn't enjoy interactive exhibits, but you're in game, there's something about it. Um, the pictures on the board at the back were people had sent us pictures of their cats, so we felt like we'd tapped into something and people would turn up and say, oh, that's my cat on the back wall. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was well received and we realized we had to design more and more levels for this. Obviously when people are coming through to your booth, you're like, oh, you got five minutes, we gotta get throughputs, right? So we handcrafted these 12 levels with this great progression curve and people got it. Um, I think level 10, People got stumped and then people felt like if they made it past it, you know, they'd achieve something. So it's so great to design a five minute experience, but we needed a bit more than that. So the basic algorithm for designing these levels was what I'd outlined before. You start with a solution, this one bit image. Then we place cats and cushions and spaces and shuffle it. And we handmade these levels so that you could um, 
you could define the starting configuration. So maybe you, you kind of trip people up a little bit. You could reinforce those game mechanics with the, uh, the early level. So the first one is just, there's just one cat and one cushion, you slide it over. Three stars, you know, you're a champion. And then we'd reiterate those mechanics. Uh, but we needed a lot more levels. Which brings me to generating levels for an echogram. Uh, just because it was too much for us to just design every level. Even though there's only 120 in the game, we really wanted to... Um, oh, maybe I was lazy, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> there's a huge number of potential levels. Um, but levels which are too dense, so you can picture that if the solution has everything covered, you don't need to move anything. All the cats are already asleep on, on a cushion. And if they're too sparse, there's just one cat and one cushion, um, they're gonna be trivial to solve. So we needed to find that sort of Goldilocks zone of density in the solution. And we also needed to be able to estimate difficulty for them. Puzzle games have uh, fairly standard user expectations, you know, they want that star rating. How do you tell if somebody's got a three star uh, solution versus a two star or one star? So we wanted to be able to automate some of that. So we, we, uh, uh, we went for this approach of assisted curation, where we would generate levels, uh, play and rate them, choose the best ones and then order them in a progression and then tweak them as required. So we thought, oh, this is it, it's made our job easy. This is just an example of a very large level. Uh, it's very difficult with playability at, at that sort of size. And we kind of realized at this point, unlike my original goals for the, the nickograms was to get these huge puzzles, um, our goals became more about creating something which reads well and is cute and people feel in, in, engaged with. So after realizing how many levels we needed to filter it down, uh, James, our programmer here, said, um, I said, we need a bunch of levels. James mentioned we should have a level editor. And I said, yes, yes, you should make one. <laughs> James is very gracious in, uh, <laughs> in taking that and running with it. Uh, the first level editor was implemented in HTML5 with JavaScript. It just allowed us to generate randomized levels or to paint levels. And it made these cute uh, scannable QR codes, which you could actually open directly in Necrograms. This is just a, a capture James uh, made, so you could see that you could set the size of the board, you can start painting the solution. Um, it places kind of cats and cushions or rows and columns, and it generates a QR code which actually has that encoded. <laughs> and this, this got interesting because you could scan that QR code with our testing build of the game, and uh, this is the main coon, who is called, I can't remember the name of the main coon. <laughs> Bean, sorry, all the cats have names. Uh, so Bean would deliver you a little message and you could click open and then you could play that game that someone had generated. Um, it, was, it was cute. Um, if you wanted to know more about that deep linking for it, talk to James here after the, the talk. Um, the second version of the edit, edit, level editor was implemented in-game. Uh, we had a lot of feature requests for the HTML5 le level editor and that was kind of, it was almost like we we're either going to re-implement the game in the level editor or we just stop work on the HTML5 version and then integrate uh, the level editor into the game. And it turned out uh, to be a good sort of change in pace, a good pivot to um, put the level editor into the client itself. And we started integrating some data collection and some analytics and feedback. So these are screenshots of early builds which had the ability to generate random levels uh, in this sort of endless mode on the client. And this is an example of drawing um, a, uh, a solution and then it would let you play that solution. This one's fairly trivial. And at this point we found that actually being able to drag them around and set that starting configuration as a designer gave you a bit more control over what you're conveying to the player. So you can kind of trip people up by putting things where they wouldn't expect it. 
Uh, we go on to user feedback. So our initial version for user feedback was great. Uh, we're generating all these levels, people can play them, and we want to get a... Sorry, am I speaking to you? No, no, it's just uh, I'm breaking out of it. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll try standing back. Sorry, no, it's all good. It's just this room, really. Okay. Just talking, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think that's better. Is that good? I'm not overdriving. Yeah. Okay. I am still talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry. So our initial approach was we thought people play the level and then we just let them say, oh, is it one star, two star, you know, up to five stars. We thought that would work well. Except it wasn't very consistent between users. People would be, oh, that was super hard. I'm going to give it five stars. Or somebody else would be like, oh, that was super hard. I'm going to give it one star. Um, so it was difficult to tell if a rating was high or low because of difficulty, triviality, or enjoyment. So instead, we pivoted to a more holistic approach where we started using iconography and some descriptive text so we can get this qualitative feedback um, as to how uh, a game is going. Now, because the solution space is really large um, for kind of programmer or maths types, if you've got a you know, four by four grid, that's 16 possible spots, which could either be on or off. So that's two to the 16 possible things. You get to very large numbers very quickly. So we found that the levels actually, every time you go in and say, give me a new level, uh, it'd be unique and different to everybody else's. So James implemented a system where you could actually start playing uh, new levels or popular levels. So instead of just getting completely new levels, you'd be like, oh, let me play the, the current top 10 that other people have liked. It's kind of inspired by that Reddit upvote, downvote, new, or, you know. And much like Reddit, we appreciate people who, who sort by new rather than just going by what's hot. Uh, this is our first uh, version, which had kind of sentences that nobody really read. People just <laughs> looked at the uh, uh, emojis or emoticons. Um, the poop one was pretty obvious if the level was broken. And then we refined that just a little bit, so it was just a picture and a word. And it gave us more qualitative feedback, and that helped us plan our level progression. Uh, this is a screenshot of our testing version. As I mentioned, it let you see the current collection, it let you see what's, oh no, sorry, it let you see what's popular or explore new levels. So we've got this huge filter now. <clears throat> Uh, the system ended up generating almost 22,000 levels. Uh, of that, with our small test set, which was the dev team, maybe around six to eight people, and their friends and family, we actually played around 10,000 of those levels. That's playing them, completing the level, and giving it a rating. Of those, only around 800 were highly rated. Now, at this point, we started thinking, gosh, should I have made James do this level generator when uh, it's filtering so much, um, maybe the time would have been better spent just hand making these levels and saving some programmer time. But uh, it turned out that it was very handy to have these levels sort of which had been curated and rated uh, available as we started um, kind of getting into the meta of the game and ordering them. Uh, and it filtered down ultimately to 120 levels which were used in Necrograms. It's an example of the spreadsheet that we had, thanks to all our testers for getting through and generating all those. Uh, this was just an interesting level where sometimes people would play the popular levels and come up with a different solution. And even though this is only a four by four grid, uh, players actually found around five different solutions for this game. So we realized that sometimes popular levels might be popular because there are multiple solutions. And this kind of affected our design and planning around a hint system because you're not heading towards this one truth for that level, which uh, nonogram purists would, would have you go after. Um, sometimes there's multiple solutions, and that's not a negative thing for our game. This is the distribution of those levels. Uh, because we'd initially had this numerical system and then we changed to this qualitative system, we had to map them to numbers. So here you could see that that zero means that they were broken, 0.5 is meh, so around half of the levels tested were either meh or broken. 
And then the ones which are rated as like, we kind of treated them as like, eh, it's, it's okay, it's not your best. And then there was only that sort of 1800 levels, which people were like, I love this level. Like it gave me some sort of joy playing it and sense of achievement. Uh, by gathering our data, we were, we were able to identify um, the elapsed time, the average play time for levels. You could see that at some point we went, oh, we can make the levels a bit bigger or a bit more difficult so that we can crank up that play time per level. Um, but we still wanted people to be able to finish a level in probably less than a minute. Uh, otherwise, you'd get to that point of frustration. Speaking of frustration, this is the elapsed time for levels, including levels that players didn't rate or didn't complete. So normally, if someone didn't rate a level, it was because they didn't complete the level. They kept playing through and they never got to the end. And you could see here these crazy spikes, like someone persisted for 42 minutes on a level. And uh, I, I presume rage quit or their phone ran out of battery, I'm not sure. But yeah, this is where all that data we're collecting and that process of generating them, sharing them, getting the analytics and the feedback was really paying off. <clears throat> so we got down to 120 levels, just throw them in in a random order, ship the game, we're done. But then we started getting an appreciation for that level progression. You'd put them in, you'd start playing them. You might have a proxy. So you could say that a proxy for difficulty is maybe the level size. A uh, three by three is gonna be easier than a six by six. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you could have a difficult uh, four by four, or you could have a simple five by six. Um, and we wanted to play on this interaction of people seeing a level, looking at the size of it and going, oh, that's gonna be a hard one. And then maybe the sense of achievement what they get when they go, oh, wow, well, I finished, I, I did a five by six. Um, but also on the other side, being able to stump players who feel like, oh, I'm getting used to this, this is only a five by four, I should be able to complete this quickly. And then we'd kind of throw them a curveball and uh, give them one of the difficult ones, which has a, an interesting strategy that you need to solve it. So from here, we had to order the levels, come up with level names. Obviously, we wanted to get as many cat puns in there as possible. Um, and then also setting the difficulty. So part of that level generation was uh, calculating a target number of moves. So when we shuffle the board or we see somebody move it to set the starting configuration, we get an idea of um, how many moves you would need to get to the solution, but it's not provably the minimum number of moves. Uh, and we thought for our curated levels, we want to make it so that to get the three star, you need to do it in what's more likely or more provably the minimum number of moves. And aside from generating the levels and writing the code for it, James was playing a lot of these levels. And often we'd get to something and just say, James, could you, can you do better than, than our estimate? And a number of those levels, uh, we did end up reducing it because um, I'm not going to say people are still better than AI, but we didn't really spend a lot of time writing to, to optimize that. I think trying to get the absolute minimum programmatically for us was a bit of a time sink, given that our limited resources and a small number of candidate levels. So we went into another spreadsheet. <clears throat> and this was um, where we have the names of those levels. We tried to give them some consistency, assign them to different worlds. Uh, the feedback we're capturing now is, was this level too easy or too hard for this point in the game? Or should we get rid of it completely? And so I don't know what our throughput was, but we would have swapped out maybe a fifth of the levels or reordered a bunch of those levels. I mentioned before that the board size is kind of a proxy for difficulty level. And we started looking at it like this. So along the bottom, uh, you've got that yellow and red line, which I think are the, the number of columns and the number of rows, so the dimension of the board. And then in green, you've got the size of the board. And that is uh, obviously the two multiplied, but that's just how many cells there are on that board. And we found that if you had just a linear progression of this, or even a step progression, it didn't feel very satisfying. It just felt more like a 
grind. You know, you're playing and now I've got one that's just a bit harder than the previous one or just a bit bigger than the previous one. Whereas because we have these difficulty ratings and these more qualitative uh, reactions to the levels, we could quickly ramp up the board size, uh, as you see with that first peak. And so people felt like, oh, I'm getting to know the game and I'm, I'm able to do these larger and larger levels. But then we could drop the board size so that you've got one that you feel, I should be able to solve this, but the difficulty for that one's actually much higher. So we're able to create that cadence with the player interaction where you're kind of feeling that you're getting challenged, but you're succeeding, getting challenged and succeeding. But at the top, it kind of levels out. And that's when people um, playing the game kind of realize that it was all a ruse. Or these 120 levels, which seemed like the game in story mode, we were just training you so that you can play the endless mode. <laughs> so the endless mode is unlocked at the end of the game. Uh, the cat on the title screen finally goes to sleep on their cushion. <clears throat> and they dream of the endless tuna galaxy. I'll just play some music here and uh, <laughs> have a drink. This music, I should be talking like this. Oh. So the uh, the endless mode, the endless tuna galaxy, is the dream of all cats. Uh, they progress through different levels of ascension, and all the levels are generated on the fly on the client. <clears throat> Instead of having a moves target or a minimum number of moves, we just have moves taken and players are able to skip any level that they want. As you play the game, you collect the stars, and that allows you to progress through these levels of uh, feline ascension. And if you skip, you lose a star, and then you go back, but you never go beyond, you never go down a level of ascension. So this was fun to create, and it really felt like, um, to me, this was the end goal for the game, that you've got something that you could play uh, to your own extent. It's fairly therapeutic, I think. To me, it's my daily crossword or um, your daily wordle or something like that. <clears throat> and this is kind of um, how the that level generator which we created, that move targets calculator, all of those things, how those things ended up in the release version of the game because we didn't end up putting in that share intent with uh, Bean delivering you things. Uh, we didn't have that capacity to then uh, maintain live ops to make it so that you can have those levels that you could vote up or vote down. And we also wanted to tie off this product, this game. And I wanted to create it in a way that it's something that maybe I could have had on the cartridge from my Game Boy Color back in the day. Uh, incidentally, to reach ultimate enlightenment, uh, which you'd have to play through to find out what the name is, unless you decompile our game and scrub it for strings, um, the player would need to collect uh, 5,280 stars, because it increases with each level how much more you have to go to. And I think my partner's uh, got the highest score. I think she's at around 3,700. <laughs> So getting towards the end of the talk, I've got a few things that we would do differently. Um, level names with puns are difficult to translate. <laughs> That's something we didn't really foresee. Um, my favorite bit of feedback uh, for the game, um, apart from so far, everyone's given us a five-star rating, um, we got some feedback from Korea when we released there. And they said that, oh, your game detects the language on my phone. We thought, oh, that's great. That's, that's what we intended. And I'm playing it in Korean. I was like, okay, great. Um, I don't really like the Korean translation. I would like to play this in the original English so that I could really appreciate sort of the puns and, and uh, the original language. So I thought, oh, great. It's like a reverse otaku. I loved it. Uh, something else I think we'd do differently. We kind of thought that Endless Mode is like our draw card, our surprise um, at the end, a reward for playing the game. 
but it adds a lot of value and it's really hidden away at the end of the game. So I think I really would have revised it and put it up there front and center. As I mentioned, we had to sh uh, drop that share level feature, collectibles, a bunch of extra worlds. I'd like to put them in the sequel. And that level rating system, which we only really developed out of that process of necessity almost to find those levels, um, we enjoyed. And I'd love to see that in, a, in the release for the wider population so people can explore levels, create new ones, share them with their friends, vote them up and down. This is the end. I've got our credits music. I've got some bonus slides as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, just before any questions, that uh, audio is what you hear at the end of each level. We want it to be something that you feel you've made an achievement at the end. Our audio director, Ben Hammersley, chased his cat around, uh, recording all the samples for it. Um, also, if you've got a device with haptic, it's got haptic feedback, so you can kind of feel the cats as you move them. I'm just going to quickly span through some extra slides. I thought I'd just put this in because we, um, <laughs> we got our mascot character, Peach Fuzz, uh, made by... <laughs> Uh, is who was at our booth at PAX a couple of years ago. She'll be here at uh, PAX. Come check out our booth. Um, yeah, oh, the rendering's a bit off. <laughs> These are my cats. You'll see them on our social media. <laughs> this is Albert, who's got a thyroid condition. Um, Peg leg Pete, who's got three legs. And Bruce, who appears twice, and he's that cute. Um, he's almost as old as Necrogram, so he's 12 years old. <laughs> This is our booth at PAX last time. We're so happy to be back at PAX and back at GCAP in person, as I'm sure everybody else is. Come see us tomorrow. And I just wanted to show off Peach Fuzz again. <laughs> so any questions, please feel free to come up to the mic uh, and I'll do my best to answer them or maybe call upon James. <laughs> I wanted to ask about, uh, you said the naming the levels turned out to be a pain for localization. Do you see that as like something you wouldn't do next time then? Or is it just sort of like, is it worth the pain? Um, I did kind of create a build of it where I got rid of all the levels, uh, the level names. And so you just went through it and it felt like something was missing. So I think if I were to make this exact game again, I would just spend more money on localization. I think I'd work with the team and um, try to get that feedback for it. Um, this is really a learning experience for us. Like we've done lots of exhibit work. Um, it seems weird to us to work for so long on a title. Like we'd usually ship sort of 20 projects a year um, to a known platform. So we're sort of fairly um, cautious with this one. But yeah, we wanted to go through, get our hands dirty. We did the self-publishing, we commissioned those translations. Um, and yeah, I think I would have done it the same, but just spent more money on translations. For the next title though, we've got a bunch of gameplay mechanics we've worked with, including, um, you know, like match three games, they tend to have a dynamic level mm -hmm. so that you clear something and that the level kind of retopologizes. And I think for that, that works with these mechanics if you extend them a bit and you don't need to have a name for that level, maybe just for that world or that theme. So I'd probably go with that, minimize our translation strings. Yep. Thank you. Um, one simple question. When's the Switch version coming out? <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect for it. I know, that's a very good question. Um, if anybody here is from Nintendo, please come and talk to me. Uh, I'd love to get it on Switch. We have planned out how we would make it work with the Joy-Cons. Uh, we had planned from the start that this is on mobile, so that's Portrait. But I've got designed a two-player version where you're cooperative, competitive. So you've got like 10 levels you have to solve. And then the first person who solves it, you both progress to the next one. So at the end, you get there together, but someone's sort of the MVP. So yes, Nintendo, please talk to me. Um, I'd love to see it there. <laughs> hey, 
Okay, um, you talked about how when you were creating the levels for the game, you generated about 20,000 and cut it down through a few different steps. With your endless mode, if they're being created on the fly, is there any kind of at that point curation to make sure the, that level will be more interesting than one of the ones that would have been thrown away from the 20,000? Uh, yes, I might grab James for this one because while we, during the curation process, we developed some heuristics mm. to kind of filter those and also work out the target number of moves. And I believe those heuristics are represented in the analyst mode. Um, either if James wants to come up or if you want to talk afterwards about any specifics. Do you have any high level things? Okay, we'll go with that answer. We have heuristics. Sure. Hit us up for more deets if you'd like. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, I'm not sure if that was answered because I, I was just walking up, I didn't understand, but um, what were the parts of the most interesting levels that kind of jumped out as something that was consistent um, that people liked? Um, I think the, the bits which jumped out for me are when you've got a subsection of the board which has a reflection in it. So it's like a little pattern to look for where you could solve the rest of the board uh, but not have this little bit solved and you need to look at it and go, oh, if I flip it about this axis and then I move those, that'll solve it. And it just gives one of those little aha moments for people. Um, it also um, was the moment that people would swear at us the most when they're playing it at the expo. We had this one level called Le Fleur, which uh, looks like a flower. And we thought, oh, it's very clever. It's in French. It's like a little hint. But people would often make it more like a tulip than a flower. And people rage quit that. Wow, we move that later into the game. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, I really love that your shirt is themed to your talk. That's wonderful. Thank you. Cat shirt, great. <laughs> uh, my actual question was, um, I found it really interesting that you, um, it was a conscious choice to cut some of the features, like being able to share levels and things like that, because they have so much exciting potential. Um, is there kind of a reason why you, as a studio, are more focused on um, a sequel uh, or anything like that as opposed to uh, live ops? It, it's more just curiosity because live ops are like pretty just so common nowadays. Yeah. Um, why would we? I think we're more focused on a, sing, a sequel for two reasons. The first one was I kind of wanted to close this one off uh, in my mind mm -hmm. as if it's. Um, you know, like going gold. Things don't go gold anymore. You don't burn it onto a CD or burn it onto a cart. But that was the mentality that I took to it. Um, and the other part is that we never really migrated the code base to a production code base. It's very much <laughs> prototype code. Uh, and when we started playing around with new mechanics, it was very difficult to implement it in the existing code base. So we've re-implemented it. Um, we've done some interesting things to it. So if anybody's interested in secret new things we're doing, uh, let me know. I don't want to give away too much, but I, I kind of like to have things very scoped and then ship it and then scoped and then shipped it. And maybe that's coming from that exhibit background where we need to have that mentality. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm really interested in the, like, is there a scaling system to the endless mode? Like, is there a way that you kind of go, this is the first endless mode, and obviously everyone's experience is different, I presume. Do you scale the difficulty, like the, further, the closer you get to ultimate enlightenment, or how does that, how do you kind of navigate that experience? Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna keep saying things until James gives me a dirty look, because I'm wrong. <laughs> But my understanding is, as I mentioned, we've got these proxies for difficulty. Mm. So the obvious ones are um, board dimension, so width and height. And then we've got the density level for it. So the further you get away from that Goldilocks zone, the um, easier it's going to be. Um, and so we use those uh, numbers, and then we kind of randomize within that range. Mm. So it might be that at the start of endless mode, you're looking at five by six levels. And then as you get further and further, you're more likely to see larger levels, and you're more likely to see um, a certain density in the board. Um, but at that point, you're kind of like, you're in the flow of it, yeah. I think. So yeah, it's, it, yeah. Cool, thank you. Thank you. 
I'm going to be so happy if this is, it's almost 45 to 40. I don't know when is the exact perfect time. I like things being on time. Five minutes. Five, oh. <laughs> I could have done more uh, yeah, dancing. I don't know. Cat shirts. Any more questions? Oh, yes. Give me five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it'll be that long. Okay. Um, so when you were creating those kind of live experiences, what were some interesting things from that creation pro creative process that you brought across to games? What some things that we could learn from, I guess, creating an exhibit that could make games more interesting? Um, I think when creating interactive exhibits, you need to grab people's attention immediately. You need to communicate the mechanics immediately. Um, you have a separation from the content and the interpretation of it. So often you've got some signage, some interpreted signage, signage to contextualize it. Uh, and I think it's just doing those things quickly. And you very ha quickly have to scope everything down. And you start seeing mechanics as negatives instead of positives. You know, like you look at lots of games which have so many mechanics and so many things in it that's seen as positive. Like, oh, there's all these things for the player to do. But for us, coming from the exhibit space, it's like, how are they going to figure this out? Like, keep it simple. And I think that's reflected in necrograms, that we've got the same mechanics. And we had to push against a lot of that pressure to like, well, what if you had cats that were squares instead? Or what if they could eat things and then they grow longer and all these extra things? And I think that it's tempting to look at those and chase them because they're tantalizing. But for us, it was more about being reserved and, and those things were seen as negative. Now, as a flip side, <laughs> I'm super interested now in maximalist games, which just have so much stuff in them. Um, so I guess it swings in roundabouts. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Thank you. Um, you sort of just covered this a little bit, but you mentioned the concept of the mechanic was something you'd had for a long time. Um, did you ever experiment with other mechanics or um, yeah, try any variations on the sort of sliding of pillows and cats? Or was that, did that work straight from the get-go? Um, I, I don't know if this is a good answer or a bad answer, but essentially um, the mechanics which are in necograms are what I'd planned out in necograms back in the day. There's been no real changes since then. We've explored other things. Um, without giving too much away, if you look at uh, griddlers or if you look at nonograms in general, there's also coloured nonograms, uh, which have a colour encoding. There's also hex grid or triangular grid nonograms. And so we had explored some of those things. Um, but essentially the, the mechanics that we'd started with are what we stuck with throughout. Um, in terms of theming, that's where a lot of our work and exploration went. I kind of made it look like straight to cats. Um, but the first version when I made a prototype back at my university days a long time ago, um, it was actually like power sockets and light bulbs and the lights would light up, uh, which appealed to me immensely, but also numbers appealed to me immensely. And uh, Lauren said, light bulbs are not cute. So I trust her artistic direction. So it was more about the aesthetic iteration than the mechanical one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go check my time. <laughs> two minutes, any more questions? A two minute question. <laughs> And it can't be name all the things yeah. in two minutes. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what's the importance of merch? You've got some. Is it worth the money? Uh, I would love to know the answer to that. Um, yeah. I, I want all the merch. I totally want a Necrogram shrine at my house covered in plushies and stationery. And I want a onesie. All those things. Um, we do have the trademark for Necrograms with the intent of merchandising things. Um, that was a, a monetization strategy that we've considered. We've considered making the game free so that we can get a wider uh, audience and then selling merch. I think it's, it's placed pretty well for it. Um, and I just personally want all the merch. Um, just set up my little shrine of Necrograms things. Um, yeah, but it's like a whole new world for us. I think it's something which we're definitely keen to explore. Anyone who does merch stuff, please talk to me. Uh, I buy a lot of stuff for other games I like, and the killer for me for most things is just shipping at the moment and the US dollar. Like I went to buy, a, I think, a Res 25th anniversary shirt. It was like $29. You go, oh, but it's US dollars. Ooh. 
and the shipping, uh, it's almost $100 by the time it got to me. So yeah, local manufacturers, local distribution, I think, or drop shipping, I don't know. Um, very keen on it, don't have much experience. Thanks very much for coming to my talk. Please come and see us at PAX. I feel like maybe I should sell some cat shirts with my cats on them. <laughs> Thanks very much.